Okay. Oh, what's the sound? Yeah, there's, a, there's some. Okay. Uh, to what? Yeah, I'm talking. <laughs> it is on. On at least. Recording in progress, it says. Okay. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and give a, give a talk for uh, the birthday of Tom Rovka, whom I know for many years uh, and know of for even longer. So I can remember uh, when I was a postdoc hearing a talk about uh, the structure formula for Donaldson invariance by Komama Mofka, and then later I had a talk in the Arbeitstagung, still as a postdoc, about uh, uh, the new cyber Witten invariance. And I've met him uh, occasionally over the years since then. I always, you know, I mean, one always sees him with this engaging smile, so uh, that uh, I hope will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, uh, yeah, I wish you happy birthday. <clears throat> so this is also reminds me of the times when uh, people in gauge theory were still were talking to me because I was doing things related to gauge theory, but uh, now I do algebraic geometry. Uh, <clears throat> and so let me talk about computation in written invariance. Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, we talk about, uh, I want to talk about modular spaces. So, uh, <clears throat> In algebraic geometry, we look, for instance, uh, at the modular space of semi-stable bundles on an algebraic surface with an ample class. So modular space would be a space parametrizing some interesting objects in mathematics. And in uh, differential topology, one could talk about the modular space of Hermit-Einstein metrics on a fixed complex bundle with, uh, uh, you know, with a Rubini Studi metric. And then uh, the uh, kobayashi hitchin correspondence says that there's a homomorphism between these two. Usually one considers compactifications between these two spaces. Uh, in algebraic geometry, the modelized space of semi-stable Korean sheaves of C rank R, churn class C1, C2, and in differential topology uh, or gauge theory, the Uhlenberg complication by ideal instantons. And uh, these have been used, for instance, to Yeah, I can turn off this sound. It also bothers me. What? Oh, it was mute. Ah. No, 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 no. It, it was mute. Okay. And so um, this uh, allows us to compute Donaldson invariance in algebraic geometry of algebraic surfaces. And now it doesn't want to. Oops. Okay, so now let's look at, uh, in algebraic geometry, we take a projective algebraic surface with a hyperplane class, and I will assume during the talk that the first petty number is zero, or maybe even that it's simply connected, and the, uh, <coughs> the B plus, B2 plus of S should be bigger or equal to three, which is equivalent in algebraic geometry to PG being bigger than zero, so that means there's an everywhere, uh, there is a, non-vanishing holomorphic two-form on S. And then we want to look at the modelized space of rank R semi-stable sheaves on S with given churn classes C1, C2. I've written down what semi-stable means in algebraic geometry. It means that the sub-sheaves uh, are not too big. They don't have too many sections. So sheaf, you can think of, if you don't know what it is, as a vector bundle with some singularities. And now this modelized space in algebraic geometry will usually be singular. It has something which is called expected dimension, which is this number I've written down here. Um, and this VD, uh, we don't know in the moment precisely what 
where this number comes from, it's the expected dimension, it's the dimension that the modelized space should have. Now we will have to understand what that means. Where doesn't it go? Okay, so just, if I write a number like C2, I mean obviously the evaluation of C2 on the fundamental class of S and so on. So, <clears throat> now, uh, waffer witten invariants, I will talk a bit more about them later, but I first give a first approximation. So, for instance, in the original paper by Waffer and Witten, there was a conjectural formula for the generating function of the Euler numbers of the modelized spaces of, say, rank two sheaves, with given first churn class and running second churn class in terms of modular forms. So, <clears throat> let me state this briefly. So, for, for simplicity, we assume there ex exists a smooth connected uh, curve in the canonical linear system. That means uh, there is a zero set of a holomorphic two form which is smooth and connected. This is just for simplicity. And um, then again, we have these intersection numbers. There's ks squared. And uh, which is the same as C1 of S squared, and we have chi of OS, which can be expressed like that, uh, the holomorphic Euler characteristic, which can be expressed like that in terms of churn numbers. And we, in, the, in this case, uh, the virtual dimension of the modelized space is given by this formula that I wrote there. And then the conjecture of Waffer and Witten, or the formula of Waffer and Witten, is the following. We take this eta function, which is a standard model of form of um, uh, weight one half, and we take the theta function for the lattice z, so sum over x to the n squared, and then, then we have the generating function for the Euler numbers of the modelized spaces just in terms of this. So we write down this expression, eight times one over uh, two eta of x squared to the 12 to the chi of OS, and the other term to the ks squared, and we take the coefficient of x to the vd, where vd is the virtual dimension of the modelized space I'm talking about in terms of the churn class C1, C2 that I've written on the other side. So this is the, the formula. Now there's a, um, what? Um, well, you know, so on the same surface, uh, you know, it, it depends for one thing. Yeah, yeah. so if, if you fix the surface, so which is given by ks squared and chi of s, then the modular space of the same virtual dimension have the same Euler characteristic, yes. So that's, uh, uh, that's our only in rank two precisely like that. But you know, okay, so this is the formula. But one should maybe be a little bit careful um, because uh, it's not quite clear whether this is actually true. I mean, this is the waffer witten formula. But um, <coughs> so this is actually, we, we now want to see in, in what sense this might be true. So this modelized space will usually be in algebraic geometry quite singular, and its dimension might be different from this virtual dimension. So in differential topology or geometry, one then usually takes uh, the equation which defines the modelized space, one deforms it, and one looks at what one is given. Algebraic geometry, one doesn't do that. One keeps the modelized space as is and adds some virtual structure which remembers what would happen if one wanted to deform it to something smooth. And so uh, this extra structure is given by an obstruction theory of dimension VD. So I want to briefly say what that roughly is. <laughs> And this obstruction theory then allows us to define virtual analogs of all the invariants of smooth varieties. So, what is this thing? So, at every point in the modelized space, which would correspond to a sheaf, uh, we have a, the modelized space has a tangent space, which in this case is this vector space x1 ff trace free. So, if f is locally free, this is just h1 of the endomorphisms of f trace free. And the obstruction space is the x2. Newman Roch uh, will compute uh, that the difference of these dimensions of these two vector spaces is the number vd. And um, uh, the Kuranishi, uh, Kuranishi tells us that there will be an analytic map, the Kuranishi map, from, the, from uh, a germ, uh, from a neighborhood of the tangent space of. Uh, of, from, uh, from, from zero in the tangent space of, of, uh, of the modular space at F to the obstruction space. 
uh, such that an analytic neighborhood of our point F in the modelized space is isomorphic to the inverse image of zero. And so, for instance, if the obstruction is zero or this coordination map is a submersion, the modelized will be non-singular of the dimension of, of the virtual dimension, but otherwise it could be also very singular. And so <clears throat> now we want to capture this in some virtual sense. So a so-called perfect obstruction theory is a way to capture all the uh, tangent and obstruction spaces at all points in the modelized space at the same time. So it's a complex of two vector bundles of finite rank, holomorphic vector bundles on the modelized space, such that for every point in the modelized space, the tangent space at that point is the kernel, and the obstruction space is the co-kernel. So, you know, as I said, it means we have kind of tied together all tangents and all obstructions together via two vector bundles of finite rank, holomorphic vector bundles. And then we can define things, so the we have the so-called virtual tangent bundle, which is just a formal difference of the, these two vector bundles. We, the virtual dimension is the difference of the ranks of these bundles. And the difficult part here is that one constructs the so-called virtual fundamental class, so a class in the cohomology cor you know, corresponding to uh, the top cohomology of a smooth uh, complex manifold of dimension, the virtual dimension, uh, which behaves like the fundamental class in some way of a smooth manifold. And uh, so this is actually the difficult part, but anyway, one can do that. And then uh, one can define a virtual version of the Euler number, which is just the integral or the evaluation on the virtual fundamental class of the top churn class of the virtual tangent bundle. And then our conjecture, which has been confirmed in many cases, is that the Waffer-Witten formula will hold if we replace the actual Euler number of the modelized space by the virtual Euler. Okay, so we have this. So this is kind of a first approximation to the Waffer-Witten statement, but Waffer-Witten actually look at something more general, which I just gloss over very fast because I don't even know precisely what the symbols mean that are here now because you are the experts and I'm just uh, uh, the amateur. But anyway, we have, say we have a Riemann uh, Riemannian manifold, a four manifold with a SUR bundle on it. Then Waffer and Witten in the original uh, paper asked us to count the solutions to a pair of PDEs for a connection on E uh, and two fields, B a uh, uh, self-dual two-form in the joint, joint bundle of E and gamma uh, uh, a zero-form in the joint bundle of E, or, um, <coughs> which is given by this formula. So this bracket with the point is somehow the, the Lie bracket together with the contraction. So if you look at this, <coughs> uh, you know, it's what does it mean to count solutions to such a thing. This B and gamma both are completely unbounded, so there is, uh, it seems to be impossible to make sense of, of saying we want to count the solutions of this. Um, now, Tanag and Thomas have found a way to translate this. So <coughs> if you have a Kähler surface, this becomes, uh, if you can reformulate this as a statement about uh, a vector bundle and uh, an endomorphism of the vector bundles with uh, values in the, in the holomorphic two forms on S. And so uh, <coughs> then they define in algebraic geometry the, the analog. So let SH be a projective surface with an ample divisor. A Higgs pair on S is a pair, E phi, of a torsion-free sheaf on S and a homomorphism from E to E tensor Ks. So Ks is the, the bundle of holomorphic two forms, which is trace-free. And there is a modelized space of stable such sheaf where the stability condition is similar to the one we had before. And then, um, uh, so we have this modelized space. And this modelized space also admits a perfect obstruction theory, which is so called what was called symmetric, which means that at every point, the tangent space is dual to the obstruction space. So that means that the expected dimension of the modelized space is zero. So kind of virtually, this is a finite set of points. Um, and so we should define the waffer witten invariant as the virtual count, which is the integral over the virtual fundamental class of this thing of one. 
Now, there's a problem with that, <coughs> obviously, because we still have no, no compactness. You know, we have a, this parameterizes pair of a vector bundle and this, uh, uh, <coughs> this Higgs field, so a, a homomorphism from E to E tensor to S, which can, uh, can, be, can, can be rescaled arbitrarily, so it's not compact, so there's no virtual fundamental class. So then one uses a trick. So if this thing was compact, one could compute in a different way by the bot residue formula. So you know you just you know integrate over the so you have uh, you know there is a C star action on this moduli space by just rescaling the, the Higgs field, and um, so then the bot residue formula would say that you can instead you know integrate over the fixed points of this action one over the Euler class. Now there's a virtual version of this where one does everything virtually. <laughs> so one, uh, there's a virtual fundamental class induced on the fixed point locus, and it, this has a virtual normal bundle, which is the part of the, tangent the virtual tangent bundle on which the action is of this uh, C star is non-trivial. And then we just formally write down the bot residue formula, and we define this the in to be the integral over one uh, on the modelized space. And so this is then the definition of the buffer written invariance. Now, if one wants to study this, one has to see what this fixed point locus can look like. So I claim now that this fixed point locus has a decomposition parameterized by the partitions of the rank of the bundle. And this is as follows. Uh, to a partition lambda, we, uh, we get the part where the E splits as a direct sum of, of sheaves of rank uh, lambda i. And uh, <coughs> the, the now equivalent map, which uh, you know, C star equivalent map uh, phi, you know, as if we have a fixed point, has, the, will then be, has to be in such a way that it just ma always maps E i to E i minus 1 tensor Ks. And uh, obviously then the last map has to map has to be the zero map. And so we have in particular two uh, special components. One is a so-called horizontal component where you know, the partition just consists of the trivial partition, so we have just E and the map phi is the zero map. And so that means this modelized space is nothing else than the modelized space of sheaves of rank R with turn class C1, C2. And we have the vertical component where um, this uh, splits into sheaves of rank one. Now, <clears throat> so there are all these wonderful numbers we have defined, so we can put them in a generating function. So which we have done in this, uh, so up to some stupid prefactor, and uh, this normalization by uh, dividing by 2r and the sign, we just have the generating function of the uh, waffer witten invariance, um, where we q to the virtual dimension of the modelized space of sheaves. You know, the model space of the waffer witten has virtual dimension zero. And so we look at this generating function, and then according to what uh, we said, we can write it as a sum of such functions, one for every partition of the rank R. No, it's just that lambda will parameterize the contribution of uh, uh, the, the fixed part uh, corresponding to the partition lambda. Okay. So let's look a little bit at the so-called horizontal part, so where the partition is trivial. So as I said, the modular space of sheaves has a perfect obstruction theory of virtual dimension Vd, and we have this virtual Euler number. And then Tanaka and Thomas show that this virtual Euler number is up to sign just equal to the contribution uh, to the waffer witten invariance corresponding to the, uh, to the horizontal part. And so we see that this uh, generating function, this, uh, this part of the uh, partition function corresponding to the horizontal partitions, is just a generating function for the Euler numbers of the model space. So in particular, the waffer witten partition function contains the generating function for the virtual Euler numbers as part of it. And, uh, so, and the, the formula that I mentioned at the beginning comes from that. Uh, now there's uh, something called S-duality, 
which says, you know, which is the origin for the fact that there should be modular forms in this. And uh, so this predicts the behavior of this generating function under modular transformations. So you should have uh, SL2Z somehow acting on this generating function and something nice should happen. So, <clears throat> so that means we write Q as e to the two pi i tau, where tau is from the complex upper half plane. And then you have the, the two operations which generate SL2Z is tau goes to tau plus one, which sends Q to itself. So this doesn't change the generating function. But the other one is uh, tau goes to minus one over tau, so the non-trivial element. And something should happen there and uh, kind of be the... And so this has to do with looking at the so-called the partition function for the Langnetz dual of SUR, which is this thing. So we sum over all... Uh, cosets of H2 of SZ minus R times H2 of SZ with a sign, ER is a R root of unity, uh, we take the uh, generating function, uh, the, the SUR partition function for C1 equal to this W. So it, it only depends on C1 modulo R times H2. And so we take this generating function and then the statement is, uh, of our written also, is that if we replace, or I mean our version of it, that if we replace tau by minus one over tau, so the non-trivial uh, element in SL to Z, uh, <coughs> so when Q is equal to E to the pi out tau, then up to sine and a simple uh, transformation factor, uh, we just get that the SUR partition, so our partition, buffer written partition function from before, translates into that for the Langlands dual. And so it is not completely evident, but if one works out what this means in concrete cases, one finds that this operation will interchange the contributions of the horizontal and the vertical part. And uh, it is known by Thomas that if the rank is a prime number, then the uh, contribution for partition will only be non-zero if the partition is either the trivial partition R or it's one to the R. And so the whole partition function consists only of these two parts and they get interchanged by, uh, by this s duality transformation. So using, if we believe in s duality of R as a prime number, then if we know the vertical partition function, we know all the buffer written invariants. Okay, so this is, and this is our motivation for looking at the vertical buffer written invariants now. So I again write down a few modular forms. There's the eta function, there's delta, which is the most standard modular form, eta to the 24. And I also look at the theta function of the ER lattice. So you know, it's given z to the r with intersection matrix given by the ER matrix. So we have uh, twos on the diagonal, ones on the uh, diagonal, the things next to the diagonal, and then we maybe minus, or anyway. Okay, uh, and so, and we also introduce this delta AB, which is um, uh, just saying if we have two numbers in the second cohomology, we say delta AB is equal to one if A is congruent B modulo R times H2 and zero otherwise. So we always, uh, and then there is this theorem, a kind of structure theorem for this vertical partition function. So this, there are some universal power series which do not depend, which only depend on the rank R. So they are independent of anything, of the surface or whatever we are interested in. Uh, C0 and Cij for one smaller equal to I smaller j equal to R minus one, some power series, such that for all polarized surface and all C1, we have this generating function it is given like this. We have something with the delta, delta function to the holomorphic Euler characteristic. We have this theta function. Um, uh, so this with the zero is the same as the one with the, without the zero, uh, divided by eta to the minus ks squared. And then we have this universal power series, c0 to the ks squared. And then the sum over all r minus one triples of classes beta i. Um, and then the contribution is only non-zero if C1 is congruent to the sum of the i times beta i. And then we have the product over the zyberg witten invariance of beta i times this Cij to the beta i times 
beta j. So this is the formula, and we have only these unknown power series. Here I should say that the zabek witten invariants, I use the algebraic geometry convention. So the zabek witten of bi is what you would call the zabek witten invariant of 2 beta i minus ks. So, so that it becomes a characteristic cohomology class. Um, and uh, to simplify what I say later, if the can canonical linear system contains a smooth connected curve, then there are only non two non-trivial zabek witten invariants, so which are not zero. The zabek witten invariant of zero is one, and the zabek witten invariant of Ks is minus one to the chi of S. All other ones are zero. So that then the formula would become a bit simpler. What? That's a math, you know, if it's called theorem, it's a theorem. If it's, if it's a physics theorem, it's called conjecture. No, I mean, that's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, okay. But, you know, uh, <clears throat> so now, uh, so we take the non-trivial part of this thing, so everything in the lower uh, line, so everything which we don't know explicitly, and we put it as a new uh, generating function. So if we know this phi, uh, we know all the uh, buffer Witten invariants, the vertical buffer Witten invariants, and we want to compute uh, them. So now we compute them, uh, we are able to compute them, um, at least to get a concrete conjecture, up, up to rank r equal five. And again, for simplicity, to make the formulas look simpler, as they are, we will turn out to be more than complicated enough, we assume that uh, KS contains a smooth connected curve so that we don't have to sum over the Witten class. And so, uh, so I put some notations. So you take a quotient of two such theta functions for the uh, AR lattice. Uh, one is the one we had before, and now one shifted by some, uh, some class in, in the AR lattice, and we call this TAR. And so it's a quotient of two modular forms of uh, weight one, uh, of a certain weight, and so it's of the same weight, and so it's a modular function. So it is in kind of invariant under the action of the modular group. And then again, I recall this definition of the delta AB. And then with this, uh, which I, we have the following. Uh, so we can first look at the rank two case, so in that case, the conjecture of buffer and Witten that I said before, if we take the S-duality relating the Euler number to the vertical invariance and then put this together with this, translate into this formula. So that this phi uh, is just delta. So it's, it's one if C1 is equal to zero, the first part, and then if C1 is equal to Ks, then it's minus one to the chi of S of this quotient of theta function. So this is this. And then this is the rank two case. Rank three case is a little bit more complicated, but not much. So we have contributions only if um, C1 is equal to zero, Ks or minus Ks. And um, we still have these theta functions now for the E2 lattice, not for the A1 lattice. Um, but in addition, we have this X plus and X minus, which are the roots of, an, uh, of, a, of an equi uh, a second order equation. Uh, so we... <coughs> We take kind of uh, in, so we, we know that this TA1 is a modular function, so modular functions are a field, so these are again modular functions in some kind of extension field. And so we have this, and then uh, now I will very quickly go through the rank four and five because it gets more and more complicated and basically incomprehensible, but you know, just to see that there are explicit functions and that one can work them out. Uh, and that the problem is not simple. There's not a simple answer. There's a complicated answer, which uh, maybe we don't completely understand. And in particular, it's not so clear how one goes to higher rank because it gets so much more complicated with time. So this is the conjecture for rank four. So we see the structure, the general structure is the same. Con we have contributions when the first churn class is zero, order two Ks or minus Ks or plus Ks. And um, we have, uh, uh, again, these uh, quotients of theta functions for the uh, A3 lattice play a role, but uh, <clears throat> we also, in addition, have this uh, continued fraction, fraction of Ramanujan, uh, which is uh, 
uh, the simpler, uh, you know, which is a, a nice modular form, which also has this product function in terms of eta functions. And then finally, we again cannot just take kind of the ready-made modular forms, but we have modular functions, but we again have to solve uh, this quadratic equation in modular forms to get this addition, this z. So, but anyway, you can see it's a very complicated, it looks very complicated, but, you know, it is completely explicit. So we, we know all the, uh, if, all the waffer witten invariants if we have this, uh, this formula. What? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, no, we haven't really figured that out. I mean, it's somehow also not maybe enough cases. I mean, it's uh, obviously you have, you know, it's some extension of gamma zero n, but, uh, but it's even bigger than that. And so, I mean, or oh, the group is even smaller. So, I, we, I mean, we don't know precisely. I mean, obviously that would be very important to, uh, to figure out. But, I mean, in some sense, as we can only do one uh, at a time, I mean, we haven't even kind of tried to figure out where precisely these modular functions live. Maybe that would be a reasonable exercise to do. No, I mean, obviously you can work it out there, there, but, uh, and then I very quickly flash to you the rank five one. So there, this is done in terms of the Rogers Ramanujan continued fraction, which is maybe one of the most well-known continued fractions uh, and uh, formulas of, uh, of Ramanujan. So you have this continued fraction, which can also be written as this infinite product. Um, and uh, then we get this uh, amazingly complicated formula. <clears throat> but, you know, at least we can see the structure is the same. So we have a contribution if uh, C1 is 0, Ks minus Ks, 2Ks and minus 2Ks so for all the, uh, the, the cosets of, uh, uh, you know, of multiples of Ks min uh, modulo 5 times Ks. And... Um, then we have some, so we have this, in addition, these beta i, which are uh, certain expressions in this Ramanujan uh, functions. And uh, finally, we, uh, and we have these theta functions for the, now for the A4 lattice, it's always AR minus one. And uh, then we now have to add to this thing the solutions of three quadratic equations in modular functions. And so this is the most complicated formula uh, that I want to, Present and uh, you know I don't expect you to understand it, but you know I just the point is there is a there is a formula which is completely explicit, and uh, you know unfortunately it's not a formula of the kind which one would think ah you know I know these ones so okay then it's obvious for six seven and eight it must be this because there's a clear pattern, I mean at least in my mind there's no clear pattern. Okay, and now we want to go to the whole buffer witten events, not just the vertical ones. So, um, so we conjecture a similar structure formula to the one of Laraka for the horizontal buffer Witten invariants, now, which is the same as the generating function for the order numbers of the modular spaces of sheaves. And so, in this case, everything is kind of dual. We replace the AR lattice by the dual of the AR lattice. So the intersection form is placed, uh, replaced by the, by the dual matrix. And uh, we take a similar quotient of uh, theta function for this dual lattice. And then the conjecture is very similar to the one before. So we have some trivial prefactor. Then we have a certain expression. So eta one over q to the one over r to the one half to the chi of s. We have something to the ks squared. And then we have again unknown power series d0 to the ks squared and dij to the product of cyber Witten classes. And then we have, again, okay, we have a sum over r minus one tuples of cyber Witten classes, uh, the product of an rth root of unity to the i times beta i type, the first churn class we were talking about. So in this case, the formula does not only depend on, on the rank and the surface, but also on the first churn class in this form. And then the product of the cyber Witten classes of these beta i's. So this is this formula where these uh, D0 and Dij are universal power series which only depend on the rank.
What? Uh -uh. Oh. What is the uh, Well, I don't know in general what, I mean, I, I haven't thought about if one puts Q equal one. I don't know whether there, I mean, it's not clear to me why. I mean, so, okay, you have a model of form, so you could go to the cusps and see what happens there. Okay, so that's maybe an interesting question. We haven't thought about it, but obviously you could go to other cusps. In some sense, you can see that, uh, we see in a moment that um, uh, setting tau to minus one over tau replaces the dij by the cij. So one thing is that if you go to one other cusp, you replace, you go, you replace horizontal by vertical and vice versa. So in, in that sense, there is, a, is, is this thing, I mean, if you're near, so not just go to the cusp, but the neighborhood of the cusp. So if that's maybe not your question, but let me uh, just say it. So, so S to LET translates into relation between the dij and the d0 and the cij. So this uh, one can actually kind of, can kind of see that this is re reformulation. And so, and it's a very simple relation if I put uh, Q equal to 2 pi i tau, the tau is in the upper half place, then d0 of tau is c0 of minus 1 over tau, and dij of tau is cij of minus 1 over tau. So the simplest possible relation. So the value of, of, of a certain cusp of the dij is equal to the one for, of cij at another cusp, and also the development in the neighborhood of a cusp of one is uh, equal to the development of the neighborhood of another cusp of so in that sense, I mean, don't know, don't know whether that helps your question. And so, thus conjecturally, we know all the waffle written invariants and ranks up to five. So, in particular, we know the Euler numbers of the modelized spaces. And in fact, uh, one can easily work out uh, uh, what this means. We have explicit expression in terms of modular forms or modular functions of the, what D0 uh, and Dij are. And so, C0 and Cij are, so we, we can apply this to the thing, we get explicit formulas for the D0 and Dij up to rank five. Okay, I don't know how much, what is the time? So I have still a few minutes, no? So then I can say a couple of words about you know, why one should believe in all these conjectures. You know, what kind of work we actually did instead of just uh, sitting and having some interesting dreams uh, about numbers. So. <clears throat> And so I want to briefly say how one can check these conjectures and find them. So, uh, so let me talk about the horizontal of a written, you know, the vertical of written invariant. So this, the part, uh, the vertical part of the modelized space, as we had seen, parametrizes pairs E phi, where phi is a Higgs field, where E is a direct sum of rank one sheaves, and um, the map phi always sends ei to ei minus one, so in a chain like that. So if I have a sheaf of rank one on a surface, it is uh, the ideal sheaf of a zero dimensional scheme, so basically a finite set of points, tensorized by a line bundle. Um, so the zero dimensional schemes are of uh, length n, so corresponding to second term class equal to n, uh, <clears throat> are parametrized by the Hilbert scheme of points. And uh, the, we had the, we, this phi is a homomorphism from EI to EI minus one tensor KS. So that means that if EI is equal to IZ tensor LI, then LI minus one tensor LI dual tensor KS must be effective. So there must be a holomorphic section of this. Okay, so we are in this situation and so we can uh, work, uh, so therefore, our thing is given by the ideal sheaves of R uh, uh, subschemes, so points in the R fold, fold product of the Hilbert scheme of points on the surface. And um, <coughs> so if we fix these BI, so these, uh, uh, the first churn class or whatever, or just a line bundle, Li minus one tensor, Li tensor Ks for, uh, 
i from 1 to r minus 1, then this fixes a component of uh, this fixed point locus corresp you know, corresponding to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, where these line bundles are these. And this component, by forgetting the line bundle, projects down to the product of Hilbert schemes of points. And uh, you know, it, uh, if we take the generating function, this is subjective. So we get the whole Hilbert schemes. You know, all the, we get all the Hilbert schemes of points like this if we, if we do this. And we have the restriction of the virtual class on the uh, on this uh, uh, <coughs> forbidden fixed component. Um, we have, can restrict it to this thing corresponding to beta, and we can push it forward to the product of Hilbert schemes, and then one can explicitly say what it is. So it will be a product of um, uh, these cyberquitten invariants of this bi, where this bi, say, are the first term class of these line bundles that are called bi, <coughs> uh, multiplied by some class gamma, which depends on, on this beta, a uh, uh, cap product uh, to, or whatever, to, uh, with the fundamental class of uh, the product of these Hilbert schemes. And so if you want to, where this gamma of beta is, a, is a, an expression in churn classes of certain universal sheaves on the Hilbert scheme. There are kind of two kinds of universal sheaves, so, uh, which I've written down here. One is the, basically the ideal sheaves, uh, kind of globalized over the Hilbert scheme. We can tensorize them by line bundles. And the other one is the structure sheaves of the subschemes, I mean, globalized. Uh, OK, so we have these universal sheaves. And so we have this expression, which is explicit and uh, in these things. And then uh, there is an old result with Ellings, Wood, and Lern that you know, if you just have lane, if you have one just on the Hilbert scheme of points, you take any uh, integral or you know, e evaluate any expression in churn classes of universal sheaves, then this can be universally expressed, so independent of the surface, uh, just in terms of the holomorphic Euler characteristic, you know, as a polynomial, uh, in the holomorphic Euler characteristic of the surface, Ks squared, Ks times this, uh, this line bundle to which you make the universal sheaf and C1 of the line bundle squared. And now we globalize this over the product of the Hilbert schemes, and then we get this uh, expression that these universal power series, C0 and Cij of Q, depend only on the vector of these intersection numbers I wrote here uh, on the surface, namely chi of OS, Ks squared, Bi of Ks, Bi times Ks, and Bi Bj. So we have just this. So they only depend on this tuple of numbers. And so uh, we can compute what they are in general by looking at sufficiently many examples. We just need to look at as many examples as we have, uh, uh, as there are elements in this vector, which are such that the corresponding vector of numbers is linearly, uh, vectors of numbers are linearly independent, then, they will de then what we compute for them will determine C0 of Q and Cij of Q, for, you know, and therefore the invariance for all surfaces. So now in this case, we can just take, to get this linearly independent tuples, we can take our surface just to be P2 or P1 times P1, and then vary uh, the BI, these line bundles. Uh, so on uh, P2 or P1 times P1, we obviously have an action of C star times C star with finitely many fixed points. And we choose line bundles to which this action lifts. So equivalent line bundles to this thing. And so, uh, so then one can show that uh, in this case, the action on the surface will, will lift to an action on the Hilbert schemes of points, which still has finitely many fixed points. And these fixed points are parameterized by tuples of partitions of n, if we take the Hilbert scheme of n points. And so therefore, we can now use localization, so the bot residue formula or tier bot localization, to compute C0 of Q and CI of Q in terms of the combinatorics of partitions. Now, as we are not smart enough, we don't find a nice closed formula in terms of whatever semantic functions and so on, but uh, we just put it on the computer. We compute up to a very high degree in Q, and we know the first whatever uh, 20 
coefficients of these power series, and these are enough to, uh, to guess and check uh, that the form formulas, or the formulas I told you are, uh, will be, uh, uh, should be the right ones. And uh, then I should also say that, you know, we have this relation between the horizontal and the vertical invariance, so the horizontal invariance can be treated in a similar way. There is a so-called Mochizuki formula, which relates, which computes, relates virtual intersection numbers with the virtual fundamental class on the uh, on modular spaces of sheaves to, to other more complicated uh, intersection numbers on Hilbert schemes of points, which, however, can again be related to uh, intersection numbers of universal sheaves. And so um, then we can use the same method to compute them, and we see that. Uh, we can also compute, it's a bit more complicated, uh, uh, so it takes also more effort for the computer, but we can compute something. Uh, we can compute rather far, and this gives us this, dual, you know, shows us that this S duality holds up to a high level, and for instance, that the relation between the Dij and the Cij uh, is true up to the level we can compute, and so we are confident it's true. Okay, so this was all I wanted to say. Yes? Yeah, they involve. N no, so I mean, um, the thing is, the Waffen Witt make some assumptions, like, for instance, they they uh, one uh, this is some i don't know whether it's precisely this assumption um so for instance they might make the assumption that the canonical uh, that there is a that the canonical is, in a system contains a smooth connected curve or otherwise they have an expression in more when they have a more general formula they have an expression in terms of the connected component of of a canonical curve and now um one can translate that so if one uh, you know, once one knows what cyber written invariants are, then this formula for this, con you know, this expression in terms of the connected components of the, uh, of the canonical curve is precisely in terms of cyber written invariants. So the, the connected components of the, uh, I mean, essentially the connected components of the, uh, of the canonical divisor are the cyber written classes, I mean, in this algebraic formulation. So in that sense, it's just, uh, I mean, the Zabergwitten invariants are, in some sense, in their formula, only it's before they invented them. Uh, yeah, so you say we, one shouldn't expect new invariants from these formulas. No, I mean, the, the whole, yeah, so this whole thing somehow shows that, uh, I mean, I mean, everything that uh, I've ever computed with these modelized spaces always can be expressed in terms of, uh, of cyber written invariants plus some universal power series. So it appears that uh, these modelized spaces, uh, at least uh, if one computes invariants like this, do not seem to contain any more information than uh, the cyber written invariants. That's true. So you know, if one is interested in finding invariants to classify four manifolds, it's kind of nonsense to... <laughs> To, to do this, but I'm more interested in the structure of the formulas. 